and good evening, everybody. We are here with .NET DC. I'm your host for the evening, Sean Colleen, and we are joined here tonight with Chris Ayers, who is coming all the way to us from, uh, was it, where are you in Florida, Chris? Uh, Tampa, Florida. I'm about an Tampa, hour Florida. west of Orlando. Yep. Nice. And you know, as we were uh, getting started this evening, I forgot to even ask you, how's the weather there? Most people don't like to ask that because it, it's usually <laughs> wonderful, um, unless it's in the summer and then it's just hot and terrible. But yeah, right now it's like eighty something. It's nice, you know, oh. shorts year round type of thing. Short sleeve shirts. Oh man, so so excited! Now, luckily, I mean, up here up here in Virginia, we've had a very similar weather today. So I was actually mentioning because I was just outside on the balcony out here, standing for a couple of minutes before we met up, and it was like, oh, that's right! I have to start, you know, thinking about working outside for a little bit. You know, some some nice, you know, for those of us who are remote, getting to step outside for a little bit is just so nice during the work day. So I wanted to at least ask you where the weather, hey, how the weather was there. So thank you everybody for joining us. I think we've got some. I see we've got some some viewers coming in now. So we're really excited to have you here, and you know we're going to get started in just a little bit, but we're going to give some folks time to, to filter in. And uh, so we've got a couple of polls here for you. Chris and I were talking before the, uh, the before we kicked off here about some things we wanted to know about uh, you, our audience. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Thank you, Stream Deck. All right, I'm going to drop a poll into. Uh, the location here, or into our chat here. And so we've got a URL where we'll do some live polling throughout. So I'm dropping that into the into the stream chat here. But for those of you who can't see that just yet, that's at pollev.com slash, in this case, Sean K431, your really nice uh, vanity anchor link there. Uh, but we're curious as to uh, to, to know, uh, you know, how many how many years have you been developing software? You know, .NET DC prides itself on, uh, on you know, having developers who are either early or later in their careers. So we're really happy to, uh, to under, you know, to, to have you out and understand a little bit more about you as well. So um, it's got some some great experience here showing up in the chat so far. And I did a word cloud, which I guess doesn't quite translate for this. So that's a lesson learned for me on the on the poll okay. format. The numbers are merging together. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, it, we'll see. We'll see if it ends up being okay. But that's maybe yeah. Yeah. Well, the number one response will be years. We've been working for years. There you go. There we go. Great. Awesome. <laughs> But I see. Uh, I think we saw less than one of the same. So maybe less than one is part of the part of the response. There, I'll have to see. Very nice. Well, this is great. I'm happy to have. I'm happy to have a lot of experience in the room, and it goes to show too that no matter how long you've been developing, there's always great ways to learn new things. And one of the concepts that we're, you know, that Chris is going to talk to us tonight about, I think, is really important for modern software delivery. And and you know, some variations of it have been going on for for a long time in the industry. But I think I'm really excited to learn how to apply feature flags to, for modern software delivery tonight, and to to learn a little bit more about some of the pitfalls and and some of the nice, you know, powerful features that we can get when we start thinking in the mindset of feature flag. So just goes to show, no matter how much you've been around the industry, uh, still folks very interested in learning new things. And Chris, I got to say, you know, I think as someone who's presenting on a lot of stuff, you seem like a, a lifelong learner in a sense. You know, what, what is your approach to learning, you know, new, new software and new technology, staying up to date on things? Well, um, I'm, I'm kind of a nerd. So I'd like to, in my spare time, um, do talks and and research technology. Um, I read a lot of um, newsletters that have links. There's some uh, like programming digests and C sharp digests. There's things like um, uh, the Morning Dew. Uh, some of my friends sure. put out um, different newsletters. So link aggregators. Um, I do a lot of reading, and you know. At my job at work, I, I give advice and guidance to customers. And so a lot of times I will will research stuff for them as well as for myself. Um, I go and get a lot of certifications. And sometimes it's I'm helping a customer with something. I'll really dive into it and I'll go get certified in that. Um, I think that it 
the certifications serve a couple of point purposes. Uh, when I was a partner and a consultant, it helped me help the company, which, which didn't hurt helping myself. But it sure. also lets me speak from a place of authority, as uh, speak from a place of knowledge. And if you're doing something like Azure development, you know, and you look at like the AZ203, um, you might use only a small portion of developing for Azure, maybe app services, maybe functions. But by going after the certification, it forces you to learn about the broader topic. So you start knowing that there's other things possible, other capabilities, how they fit together, and it just rounds you off. Um, even 10 or 15 years ago, I remember when Web 2.0 came around and there was a shift from a lot of back-end development, like you know PHP and ASP and Cold Fusion and that sort of thing, to, hey, we're going to do a lot more JavaScript and have you know, Ajax calls and, and interactivity. You know, there was Knockout, there was Backbone, Ember, and then Angular JS came out. And now we've got this huge swath of technologies, React and um, mm -hmm. Vue. And I saw people who were .NET developers go, I don't, I'm a .NET developer. I don't want to learn JavaScript. I don't want to learn mm -hmm. that. And I've told myself in my career, I never say I don't want to learn a thing. Um, I fell in love with functional programming um, learning JavaScript. And then that made me want to go learn like Haskell and Erlang and F sharp. Um, I say you can always pick up technologies and techniques and, and ways of thinking about things by just learning from anywhere you can. So I, I never say, no, I don't want to learn that. Um, well, unless it's Jenkins or Java, but that, 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 that's just a personal preference. <laughs> <laughs> and that's and I think, well, I think that's and that's that's fair to say that you, you've got you've got personal preferences, but I, I think that's the the key for me too. And I feel very similarly that when I when I don't know something, it is usually the start of a really fun adventure for me, where I get to dive into that thing and learn about it and 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 think about how I could apply it in new and new and different ways. And so whether it's you know for me, I tend to be a little more hands on. Like I really I I always have a hundred side projecty things going, and that's for me the way that my brain needs to stick with stuff you know i i used to consider certifications and you know i i don't mind going through the content and learning for the certifications mm -hmm. but it's something yeah. it almost to me it almost always felt wrong to like then go take a test as if that necessarily proved something you know i was i kind of wanted to say okay i want to spend that time applying it instead <laughs> but i totally get the value of certifications in so many in so many yeah. scenarios too you know and being able to test your knowledge and verify that you've truly really picked up some of the content there so it's always i, I think the key there is that whatever format that you you're interested in, whatever format that you want to uh that, that gives you that excitement or that engagement it's a good idea to figure out what that is and 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 go with it yeah i mean i like learning things um but as a as someone who is a consultant who talks to customers a lot sometimes customers listen a little bit better if they see you have a certification in the thing you're talking to them about sure well, I got to say, you know, as a consultant who is doing a lot of, you know, who's helped a lot of people with a lot of problems, uh, do you do you have any generic advice for folks out there who may be looking to go into consulting or folks out there who may be in oh, a yeah. consulting role in terms of what you've learned from your time? And that could probably be a whole other talk, I'm sure, but what you've learned from your time <laughs> as a, as a, you know, a, a, in your role in helping customers, any, any gems for to help mm -hmm. someone succeed in that space? Uh, first, it's very easy to start solutioning before you know the problem. So the consulting 101, listen, listen, mm -hmm. listen, listen. Um, and when you're in a consulting practice, if you're in a professional consulting service, a lot of times when you're in there interacting with the customer, listening will also give you that next project because you can hear while you're working with them, that they're, working, they're, they're planning on doing the next thing. Um, so being professional, listening, um, asking the right questions, not trying to jump to a solution that you know. I mean, um, I, I've definitely seen the shiny hammer syndrome in lots of organizations, lots of engineers. Somebody has a favorite tool. They love it. They're going to use that for everything. Everything looks like a nail. We're just going to bam, bam, bam. And it doesn't always fit. You know, right. sometimes functions are the right answer. Sometimes it's containers. Sometimes it's just an app service. You know, I know th there's just lots of techniques and options out there, but 
the flip side of it is also there's a lot of education that needs to happen. When, when you're a consultant, you're dealing with clients. A lot of times, if it's something new, they can be afraid. And so they want to do things the way they've done it. Um, I've helped so many customers move from being on-prem into the cloud. And, you know, there's the, well, we've built it this way for 10 years. Here's our end tier application and this. And sure. as you start getting into the cloud, trying to understand there might be new practices and techniques around DevOps, around um, app resiliency. You know, you, you might need to look at eventually consistent models. You might need to look at more distributed messaging instead of direct rest calls, maybe start using message buses or event grids or event buses so that you can send messages and do, you know, that sort of processing. And it just, there's education because it's new and, and new sure. scares a lot of people. Yeah. Then there's a, there's a new tax in a lot of organizations right? where you've got the, you know, there, there's a, a, a true cost to achieving something new, especially in a large organization. And that gets into sort of change management and how do you help introduce those things and, and onto those things. And yeah. So, you know, well, thank, thanks for that, Chris. I appreciate it. And I'll probably keep rapid firing questions at you throughout. But uh, right. for those who are joining us, thank you for being <laughs> here. Uh, we've got we've got Chris Ayers here with us uh, on the line. And if you are uh, just joining us, I put up another poll there on our poll everywhere. Just curious as to whether you've used feature flags before. Uh, and so uh, we've got, you know, uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, Yes, but not in the .NET ecosystem, or we've got, uh, you know, yes uh, or not yet. And so we'll go, we'll see here. Wow. And don't worry, I voted yes. <laughs> I, <laughs> thank you. I, I have to shut this down right now. Click end broadcast. Um, <laughs> That's great. And while and while we're doing that, I do want to give a shout out to, to Nathan Kahn, who's joining us here, a current teacher who has been in a coding boot camp and looking to become a C sharp and .NET dev. Nathan, I absolutely love that. And uh, before I went into uh, software development, I had dreams of of being a teacher, and I still love any chance I get to to learn or to teach things. So I just want to say cheers to you for uh, for continuing your journey and continuing to to learn things and learn about the ecosystem. So seriously, thank you for being here. Awesome to have you and right. um you know i wouldn't be where i am today without my teachers like i started programming mm -hmm. in elementary school um i remember cub scouts getting introduced to logo and then in fifth grade my having a programming session in our classes and our, our my teacher encouraging that you know might have been basic at the time but it still encourages a way of thinking Absolutely. And just in and, and that way of breaking down a problem and how do you, yeah, how do you, how do you learn to learn? How do you learn to, mm -hmm. to, to work your way through that? And I think of that all the time when it comes to things like debugging and learning methods for, okay, how do you learn to break down a problem and think about it? And, and absorbing those concepts is so huge so it looks like we've got a lot of uh, a lot of folks have some familiarity with feature flags which is great so um and i do like that a certain percentage of, of you 30 percent so far have no experience so i think we're going to span the spectrum tonight i know chris you've got some some conceptual groundwork and you've got some some uh, some examples to show us this evening which is great so yeah. you know in the in the interest of time i'll probably jump right into the uh right into our presentation here uh, we'll jump. We'll start at the start. Uh, how about that? And we'll we'll go from there. So yeah, again, for those of you who are joining us, welcome to .NET DC for May uh, 2022. I'm here, uh, your host Sean Clean, here with Chris Ayers, and we are. I'm sorry. Am I saying is it right? Ayers or Ayers? Yep. Yep. Ayers. Okay. All right. Cool. Great. So we just want to give a quick shout out to our sponsors this evening. You may tell from my polo uh, that I am affiliated with such a sponsor. Uh, we've got uh, Excel is our sponsor this evening. They allow me to do this. They they hang out. They pay for the StreamYard subscription. They sponsor .NET DC. So big thanks to, to Excel for allowing me to be here and allowing this meetup to happen. Uh, I'm very grateful to you for that. Also want to point out for uh, those of you who are into printed books or ebooks, we actually have a sponsorship from Nanning as well. Uh, and so if you're interested in a print book or an ebook, feel free to use that 30% off code there, which is UG367. Uh, that's going to get you 30% off of a Manning ebook or print book. I tried it last month and it still works. So I'm willing, willing to assume it's, it's, it's probably still going. Um, do want to ask uh, if you've got questions or if you've got um, 
uh, you're looking to hire, you're looking to get hired, anything else you want the group to know, feel free to throw that in the chat as we're going and, and pop that along, you know, pass that along here. And uh, if I've got some, if I see something pop up here, I'll, I'll be sure to feature it on the chat um, as we're going through things. And lastly, I want to point out here too that we have an online uh, presence here on GitHub at github.com slash dc.net. Um, what I want to point out about that is that we do have uh, calls for topics if you want to hear about a certain thing. We also have calls for speakers if you're interested in speaking or interested in raising your hand to do a lightning talk or something like that in the future. Uh, definitely feel free to add yourself there because we'd love to put stuff together from you know all across the community and get as many folks involved as we can. Uh, but certainly the, you can see the schedule there. Uh, with, you know, So we try to do everything as open as in the open as possible uh, in terms of what we're doing. So feel free to check that out and, and participate there as well. Um, Want to say thank you to the .NET Foundation as well. Uh, if you're not familiar with the .NET Foundation, they are an organization you know, dedicated to advancing um, open source in the .NET community and helping you know, maintainer projects or member projects um, you know, be the best that they can be in the community. Here, so they're, one of the nice things that the .NET Foundation does for us as a community is they allow us to uh, use the .NET Foundation virtual user group, which connects folks from all over the world. Uh, and so this user group is advertised not just on our meetup, but on the .NET Foundation's virtual user group. So if you haven't checked them out, highly recommend doing that because you have a lot of great meetup talks that come up all the time. Uh, it's a great way to kind of soak up that knowledge, as Chris was saying earlier. And it's, uh, I really like it because it kind of radiates a lot of different topics to me that I can pick and choose from if I happen to have time in my schedule. So definitely recommend checking that out. So a little bit about Chris. Chris is a senior customer engineer on the Azure Fast Track team at Microsoft, and you know he enjoys speaking at meetups as he's doing right now. Um, also an avid reader and gamer, uh, or as Chris said when we were talking beforehand, you can just generally summarize that as nerd. Um, yep. But uh, you know, Chris, I'd love for you to tell us. You know, I realized I hadn't asked you this early on. As we go into your talk, I'd love to know what what is the Azure Fast Track team at Microsoft? Like, what what do they do? Yeah, so there's actually a number of fast track teams. There's fast track for you know like M365. I'm on the fast track for Azure team, and you know inside of that, what we do is we help Azure customers. We give them guidance, advice. We we pretty much come in and help them de-risk the things that they're building in Azure. So if you're building a solution and you're running into a problem, or you have multiple different technologies you're trying to integrate, and maybe the documentation has a gap. Or the samples are, are, are giving you a problem. Um, there, there is a nomination process. There is some requirements for getting into fast track. But what we do is we help specific projects get into production in Azure. Um, and it is something that is a, a free service for our Azure customers. Um, I work wow. with the product teams very closely. We do, you know, documentation updates, samples. We even do uh, some some sessions like this through our FDA live program. So, well, I phenomenal. We're, well, we're happy to have you here, and and I know that uh, very excited to get to the talk. And so, without further ado, I think we've we've hit some critical mass for folks who are going to attend today. And so, uh, I'll go ahead and or you can add your presentation from the stream yep. there. I think you. Yep, I'm ahead. sharing my screen. All right. Oh, oh do I need to do that? Yeah, let's see. Here. I think no? so. There we go. All righty. All right, so you've got your screen there, and so I will I will hop off, and we'll let you get started. And just so you know, folks, uh, feel free. Chris is fine with being interrupted in the middle, so feel free to jump uh, dump questions or comments into the chat, and I'll batch them up, and then I will have the wonderful uh, job of interrupting Chris uh, midstream and and uh, and throwing some questions at him. So definitely feel free to make this as interactive as you want. Looking forward to hearing your questions and comments in the chat. And Chris, with that, I will go ahead and get out of your way, and, and you can take it from here. Thanks. Sounds good. Thank you, Sean. So again, this is feature flags, the art of the if and deployment. And so I'm going to start out with about you know half of this time. We're going to talk about some theory. We're going to talk about why we want to use feature flags and what they are. Um, as he said, I'm, I'm a senior customer engineer at Microsoft. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. You can find my blog. I, I don't blog halfway as much as I feel like I want to. So. But there's some good stuff out there and hopefully more coming. And then um, I do have a GitHub and my samples I'm presenting today. And these slides are actually in, in GitHub. The, these are markdown slides I generated. So um, topics, like I said, what are feature flags? I, I want to make sure there's a clear understanding of what they are and what they aren't. 
um, why we're going to use feature flags or why those might be valuable to us. Um, what's the difference between deployment and release? These terms always get mixed up. And I think it's very important that we, we differentiate what those two concepts are and then how we're going to operationalize our feature flags. So if we make a decision to start leveraging them, what can we do to leverage them at scale? So what are feature flags? Well, I mean, they started, and you can do this. I've done this. I think a lot of people have. You can just set a variable in your code, then maybe you comment it. You know, you have it set to true, you have it set to false. You just put an if around a block of code. Um, this works. I mean, a feature flag is just a Boolean to a degree. Is it on or off? So you might say testing equals false or true, and then it'll execute that block of code, and then you can check it in, and then you can test equals false and check it back in. It's really cumbersome. Uh, there's a lot of steps involved in that. We've got to check in code. There's this long history of stuff. What if we had a method or, or something that could evaluate what our flag should be at runtime? You know, and this could be based on any bit of information. We, we could have a context that tells us information about the user, about the calls that are coming in. We could have a call out to a database that tells us is the row, you know, is it enabled for that user or that row of data or not? We could call out to a REST endpoint. So, you know, as we start moving from very static uh, feature flags that are checked into our code base into more dynamic feature flags that are driven by configuration, by, by some sort of endpoint, it gives us a lot of power. And so you might have heard of the term feature toggle. So feature flags and feature toggles are very interchangeable. Um, they, they, they pretty much mean the same thing. And like I said, most of these are simple Boolean values. Now, the reason it might be a string or another value is, what if you're looking for a username or you're looking for a role or something like that? It might still evaluate to a Boolean. You know, are you in this group? Uh, is your name Bob? Are you using Chrome or Firefox? But I don't want to muddy the waters too much because there's a lot of usage for feature flags. And it's easy to label anything that's got an if in it. Oh, well, that's a feature flag. And, and I think there's actually a lot of different uses for feature flags. Um, and, and I want to spend a little time here. If you if you have comments about this or questions, please ask. But you know, as you're rolling things out, maybe you're working on a feature. It's going to take two or three sprints. And you want to be able to still check in your code, run your unit tests, you know, deploy things out. You don't want to have to um, revert code. It, or hold a branch for a long period of time because something's not ready. So maybe you want to be able to check in your code but not release that feature out to users. You can use a feature flag to work around uh, incomplete features so that they can still release and ship code out to production, but you're not releasing those features to your users. You know, maybe you have a new feature that you want to start releasing, but you're not sure of the impact to the system, to the users, to the company. So you might want to slowly increase the rollout. Maybe you want to do 10%, 20%, and, and monitor the system the entire time. You know, you're switching from one algorithm to another. You're not sure if it's going to have a resource impact or bandwidth impact. So you can slowly increase it to see what might be going on. You know, maybe you have... I mean, this this is a case of doing ring deployments or, or, or progressive rollouts. And I'll, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later. Um, maybe you want to run tests in production. Hypothesis-driven development. Does the red button or the blue button have more interaction from users? If if we do, Should we use a hamburger menu or a, a little arrow that rotates? Uh, should we, you know move the content right aligned or left aligned? Should we add this call to action here and see if we get more interaction? We can use feature flags to do those tests in production. Um, one I don't think people think about a lot is a kill switch. You know, um, Once things have been deployed, we can start leveraging um, the kill switches. Like we've deployed out a feature and we're starting to see 
a rise in errors or a problem, we could turn it back off very quickly without having to revert code, rebuild, redeploy. We can just revert back that feature. John, I saw you come on for a minute. Is there a question? Just a mistake on my part. You're all good. <laughs> okay. Um, maybe, um, so I've worked in retail. I, I've I probably worked in <laughs> most industries at this point in my career, but um, I worked uh, with a restaurant organization and every year they had Mother's Day. Mother's Day was this huge event. Uh, just like Valentine's Day, you know, a lot of a, a lot of reservations, a lot of information on their websites that was very specific, like LTOs, limited time offers that were very specific around those time periods. And so they used to have, oh, we got to prepare things. We got to do this big release. We've got to have everybody on uh, like, like a war room. We got to do a big deployment. Well, you can leverage feature flags to enable something for a given period of time. You could deploy a month ahead of time, a year ahead of time, a week ahead of time. And you could have you know, those limited time offers, maybe a UI change or different color theme. You could have it trigger for a certain date to turn on and automatically turn off on another date. So you don't have to worry about doing a big deployment right before Black Friday and then another deployment the day after Cyber Monday to take down all those sales. You can time those things. Um, UI changes, code changes, algorithmic changes based on calendar events. But, but there's a lot more than just this. I mean, maybe you want users to sign up for preview features. I've seen that on Azure DevOps. I've seen that in like Twitter, I've seen that in different places where you can maybe see toggles that you can enable for yourself that might let you opt into a new feature. Maybe there's a feature you don't want people to have access to. You want to block them from people. This is uh, like, an, you know, somebody has been, you know, abusing a, a feature and you just want them to not be able to have access to that. Um, now, some people, like this is where you start getting into what's a feature flag and what's business logic, because this can be leveraged in different ways. And, and it really varies upon the business model, the business and the organization, how they interact with customers. Maybe you're leveraging subscriptions. You know, maybe you have like a, a basic tier and a premium tier. That's one way you could leverage it. You have advanced users that want to see, um, configuration values that they wouldn't see normally. And so they want, they want to show advanced options and then they can leverage something. You need to maybe start getting people off of a system um, because you're doing maintenance. So you're limiting certain actions inside the system. And this, this starts to change feature flags into more operational flags. But um, like I said, there's, there's usually a little bit of gray area as you, you, you leverage the different use cases. Um, load management, I think, is an extremely interesting um, use of feature flags that I, I've seen in a couple of places that I think could be adopted more often. Um, let's say you're working on a new recommendation engine, like maybe a marketing engine for an e-commerce site. And it, it can be intensive. You know, it's doing queries against your order history. It's looking at inventory and sales. Um, what about on Black Friday? You're getting tons of hits. You're getting tons of traffic. And you want those resources maybe to go towards serving the site instead of trying to do some extra optional sales. You could have the system automatically know when load it gets to 75, 80% to disable certain parts of the site to keep it going, to, to reduce the load on uh, the internal systems so they can serve more traffic. So you could disable your recommendation engine when it hits a certain piece of load, that way it can taper off and handle more traffic. Um, feature flags also allow you to isolate parts of your code base. You know, you have your old implementation and your new implementation. You can leverage libraries. You can use other features in .NET like dependency injection to help keep your stuff separated and then leverage the right piece of code when it's needed. And finally, you know, you, you can start turning on and turning off feature flags to taper off systems. You know, if something that's really old and you're trying to get people off of it, you can start turning off features. You can start disabling access to the V1 features as you start pushing them to the V2 features. And then you can start removing that code from your code base. So 
looking into feature flags gives you a whole bunch of tools that you can use to help build your systems more reliably. Now, like I've said, not all flags are the same. Now, in the short term, I use these a lot. These are where I'm building a branch to implement a new feature and I'm surrounding my code with a feature flag, or we know we're gonna be doing an experiment. We're gonna try something out. We're gonna surround our code base, um, the, the parts of it that are impacted with feature flags. They could be anywhere. You know, Maybe in the startup, we're leveraging service A over service B with the feature flag. That, that might be you know, very early in the, the process of an application. Maybe it's a UI element. Maybe it's an algorithm inside of a service. So they can kind of be anywhere. And when you implement a feature flag, that is technical debt. You're adding this logic that ideally should be kind of short term into your code base. You've got old code and new code living side by side. And so it can, it can cause some brittleness. It can also lead to some refactoring problems if, if you're not careful. So you need to be very aware of what's in there. Um, and I'm, I'm going to talk about that more when we get to best practices a little bit. But maybe we have longer term feature flags. And I talked about that earlier, subscriptions or turning stuff on, and they can start to turn into business rules. You know, they might turn into operational flags. And you might not still call them feature flags. They might start out as a feature flag and they, they, they grow up. There's a lot of like gang of four patterns out there that you can leverage. And I know that there was a couple of people that were a little newer. So gang of fours design patterns. It was originally from a book that was in Java, but these patterns are some of the foundation for many of our software engineering practices, like strategy visitor and command can directly apply to leveraging feature flags to how we're going to toggle, you know, this implementation versus that implementation. So I'm going to pause there for a second, see if any questions pop up while I take a sip of water. But like, these are some of our options as we start leveraging feature flags in our implementations. All right. So now words, they're important. So the words I use and, and the way I explain it, deploy and release are not usually the same thing. To me, deploy is a very low risk, repeatable and routine action. This is what our CI CD pipelines do. This puts bits on servers, okay? This deploys code to production. Can deploy it to dev, can deploy it to QA, deploys bits to production. That is an engineering activity. So we're gonna build and release it out or deploy it out. Now release has a different kind of meaning. This is higher risk. This is where we're releasing our features. We're releasing new functionality. We're going to give access to the new UI 2.0. This, this comes on the tail of the big, you know, newsletter, news release that, that the businesses put out. Hey, version X of this is coming out with these new features. That That's the release. And so leveraging feature flags lets us separate these two activities. Let's just pull them apart. You know, we can have a feature that is turned off and we can deploy it out to production. People aren't able to access it. We're not leveraging the new algorithm. It's been coded, it's there. It's turned off. We're not leveraging it, but we were pushing bits. It's a very common thing that we're doing constantly. Um, when you when you talk around DevOps and, and you, you talk about it a lot, you you start seeing patterns. And I've seen this in in some big organizations where they do a release and they mess up. Something happens. Forgot a database change, a config file, something. And so let's slow down. Let's not release every sprint or every week or every day. Let's release next sprint and we'll use, we'll take this build and we'll test it next week and, and we'll have like a hardening sprint and then we'll release it. So we'll release every other sprint. That way we will be sure we won't mess up. 
and then something invariably happens because we're human. Okay, let's release once a quarter. Let's release you know, every six months. Let's release once a year. Like you start seeing people slow down because they think more testing and more looking at it's going to catch everything, and it doesn't. Um, one of the things that's good about leveraging feature flags is, like I said, there's a kill switch. Um, if you're vigilant about leveraging your flags, you can start with features off and, and test them reliably. So deployment and release. And the other thing this lets you do is limiting your blast radius of change. This works very, very well with other deployment patterns. So there are, there are deployment patterns that are like canary releasing progressive deployments, which is ways to put bits, blue green deployments, where you're putting some bits here and then flipping over, you know, which, which way the traffic is going. That's for how you push bits. Um, but this could be, hey, the bits are out there, the system's running fine, we're gonna toggle on a feature. Um, conditional compilation type of feature. I usually- um, hey, Oh, so actually so I, was the, gonna, I was gonna jump in there for to, to pull <laughs> it up on the screen actually there, Chris. So we have a question here from, from Marcelo around, do you consider conditional compilation a type of feature flag? Uh, I technically, I guess it could be, but you know, how, how do you change it? So you got conditional compilation. Cool. Can I toggle it on and off or do I have to go change that and check it in and do another build and another deploy? To me, that I mean, was yes. separation as well. It's the, the act of, <laughs> act of, do you have to rebuild or recompile the software in order to be able to toggle so, it on and off? So going, go, going back a little bit, if I had this, let's say this was in a CS proj file or a solution file or uh, a, a configuration file where I pulled in some code or others or I did a conditional compilation step, I would have to check it in to rebuild it. This is more dynamic where I can point it at a service or something and it can evaluate at runtime, which gives me more flexibility where I don't have to push bits again to change a feature. So I, I am a big fan of not having to push new bits to turn on and off a feature. And there's a and the one comment I wanted to mention to you. You were uh, you noted around um, you know folks slowing down because they think that's going to help them avoid mistakes. And and for those of you who may find yourself in similar situations or are trying to make the case to to help avoid that, a great book you might want to pick up is the book Accelerate or the latest version of the Dora Metrics for for DevOps. Yep. Easily one of my favorite recent books in the industry. And it, <laughs> and one of the things it does is put some data points to the fact that actually it turns out that when you have more releases, your risk of change failure goes down. Um, so it's not not yep. either or it's actually <laughs> yes and both uh, and so that's one of the you know a, a functionality like this is, is hugely important to achieving things like that so i'll drop a link to the book in the chat um thank you I will, I will let you get back to it chris yeah no um and and accelerate came from uh dora the devops research um alliance or whatever it was i don't remember the exact name it stands for but it's been funded by a number of different organizations over the years um a lot of the members that do the research there, some of them are now at Microsoft studying developer velocity. And a lot of these practices we're talking about um, releasing more often and you know, using CICD and techniques like feature flags lead to better satisfaction at work, like better mental well-being because you don't have to do those um, Saturday night, two in the morning, calls for four hours coordinating eight different teams um, and accelerates an amazing book. I highly recommend it. So, you know, we've got this idea. Maybe we want to separate our deployment, our release. How do we operationalize these flags? How do we start dealing with these at scale? And I talked about how it's a pain in the butt if you're checking in code and having to do a rebuild every time you want to change a feature. And that same applies for trying to go across environments. Um, I am not a fan of Git flow. Um, I do not like long-term branches. I do not like a branch per environment. Um, I'm a 
big trunk based development guy. I, I, I like a main branch and build it once and transform my config per environment. Like that, that's how I like to do things. Um, and you know, that means it's the same bits that go everywhere. You know, I, I, I care about the bits that are being deployed to make it have some confidence that the bits in dev or the bits in QA or the bits in prod. But how do you know what's turned on and off? You know, is it, hey, I did a, a build for dev and it's got this flag on and I've got a different build for QA and it's got that flag on and I got a different build for prod and it's got this other flag on. It's really hard to know with that model, with branches and check-ins, what's where. Um, now, the same thing could be said, you know, using a service, but uh, we'll get to that in a moment. So what about users or what about servers? You know, I've, I've worked with companies on-prem that would have a server that had a machine config that was different from the other ones. And they would that's how they would test a configuration. They would change the server so that the setting was different or they pointed a DNS entry at a different point so that it behaved different. Maybe it's per user. Maybe there's a they're in a different group or there's a row in a database or a property on that user that influences whether they're going to get a feature or not. Or maybe it's just evaluated at runtime and via a REST call, via some undetermined series of properties about that person or call. Um, and so this is where it's deceptively harder than you think. I mean, there are you you can make a database table that has a feature flag and you can say true, false, turn it on and off. What a lot of the services out there, and the two I'm going to show today, Azure App Config and LaunchDarkly, they have SDKs to integrate into your applications so that you can transform your connection string out to the services. You have an SDK to query as the feature enabled, disabled for some you know, number of properties. And it can evaluate that at runtime. And the services give you a UI. So you can go out there, you can compare environments, you can have reviews on configurations, on whether flags are on or off, and there's a UI around it. And these let you go out and interact with the flags and have it reflect in your application without code changes and redeployments. This also gives you the capability to do targeting. So the SDKs and the, the, the frameworks, like I said, Azure App Config and LaunchDarkly, lets you target a number of things, time, uh, region, you can target it by user details, like are they in a group, a user, a domain, a company. You could do progressive rollouts by percentages. You could release something out there 10% and then go change it later, 20, 50, 100. You could just do 50-50 testing to, to do that experimentation. And then you can have triggers, you know, you could do automation. So you, you can have your monitoring system run you know, Azure Automation. You could have it run some sort of function that maybe it goes and turns off the, the flag. Maybe it's something that evaluates more often. So it gives you that control. And I already said, flags are technical debt. Like the, the, the second you add them, you're dealing with it. Um, there, there's some, some great uh, references here in, in LaunchDarkly's uh, repo to talk about stuff. And I also want to ask uh, just a quick question. I, I don't know if you can quickly add a question to your poll. Who has heard of Knight Capital? Knight Capital. Uh, and I'll tell you why. While I, uh, I haven't seen anybody add it in the chat, but I am familiar with the story of Night Capital. It's a, I think I think there's maybe at least a few people who aren't familiar with it, so definitely yeah. tell that. All right. So strategies to manage cases where features are sprinkled throughout sequential. Oh yeah. Well, some best practices. <laughs> um, and and yeah, having nested features is a big problem. Like you, you need to be very careful when you're nesting features inside of features because you can turn one on and expect it to work and it not work. And you can turn off one and it can and break a lot of things. But, um, and I'll get into that in a moment, but always have a naming convention. Look, guys, we're using modern languages. I, I don't think we're limited to eight characters, no vowels. Like we can use <laughs> 
full full featured descriptive names of things um have a central location like have one spot to look at the flags have, have some sort of way to see what flags are in the system so that you're not hunting and pecking for them all over those flags should be discussed like if you're adding a feature um share hey i added a feature flag to surround this feature um it's off you know what you have discussions with the product owner what are we planning on turning it on you know what what's our discussion around testing strategies and release strategies that should all be discussed like we should be communicating about this stuff um and then never repurpose it and then i'll, I'll answer your question eric so the reason i asked about night capital they were a um, investment company. They, they traded stocks and they had software that traded stock very quickly. And they had leveraged feature flags at some point in the past. They, they had um, a new regulation was coming out, like a new um, way to trade, I, I believe it was, was coming. And so they were implementing this, this new thing. It's called power peg. They were, they were implementing this thing. And they, they used a feature flag and it turns out they reused one. And there's, this is like a series of unfortunate mistakes. Like all that happened at once. They like, they repurposed one. They had eight servers that were doing this and they deployed it out with the flag off on like seven of them, but they put the flag on, on one of the servers. And so it started doing like crazy trading, um, like buying high and selling low and just, huge volume of traffic, like the volume of stock trade just went through the roof. So they tried to fix it by redeploying things. So they redeployed the code on all eight servers. So they, they put bits out again, but they turned the flag on everywhere now. So now all eight servers were, were, were doing this. And in about 45 minutes, I think they lost like half a billion dollars um, because of shorts and, and longs and everything. And they ended up declaring bankruptcy within like a year. They, they they tried to mitigate it, but they they had like huge huge losses. And prior to that, they were one of the largest groups trading on the stock market. Um, if you Google or or, or you know look up Night Capital, um, you, you'll definitely see some blog posts about it. But never repurpose a feature flag. You know, and, and to Eric's question, too, I think that if you've got a lot of if statements and you have sequential business logic, to me, that's a sign that you may want to encapsulate that logic in a more domain relevant yeah. concept so that it's clear where those features reside and what part that what what part that code is playing in your overall business process. And, uh, and that, clear yeah. architecture, like leverage the design patterns. Don't just have eight nets to diffs all over the place. It's a good potential. Evaluate and remove them. Oh yeah. Re remove them. Like if they're no longer in use, if you finish the feature, don't keep the flag around. Now um, our flags, our code doesn't live in isolation. We work with data a lot, which raises a question as I change my code and I start modifying my endpoints, how do I, what do I do with my data? Well, my recommendation that has served me well, that has, that has helped me in a number of organizations, be additive. Try not to ever change the schema, like, like change a field from um, a string to an int or, or something like that. What will happen is now you have to have that big call with everybody on, on at two in the morning, you know, taking the site down, deploying the database, deploying the code. If you're additive where you you just add another field right next to it, maybe you can set up a trigger to copy the data, but you can you can have the old fields and the new fields live side by side. The old code can still run accessing the older fields. New code can still run accessing the newer fields. So you can start deploying these databases out weeks in advance with, with both fields there. Like I said, triggers if you need them to, to do some sort of synchronization. And you can obsolete the old field saying, don't write any more code accessing this. Start moving off of it. You can now deploy your data at any point. You can deploy your application, roll forward, roll backwards, and you've separated your data deployment from your code deployment, which is huge because otherwise 
oh, well, you might need to take the site down and you might need to, you know, do the big deployment orchestration or let's take a backup of it and try to snapshot it later to, to get the data in place. So that's my advice on, on data and JSON models that go along with your applications, the, the DTOs and, and the like. Uh, try to be additive and, and deprecate. So I think that's enough theory. Um, we can look at some samples now and then we'll come back. So, all right, you can still see my screen. All right, so let me, and you guys see my screen okay? Is that is that big enough? I, I switched from dark mode to light mode thinking that that, that might be more helpful. I, th I think it's pretty, it's, it's definitely clearer for me than it was a couple of seconds ago. I think you're good. All right, so I don't need necessarily to use a service to use feature flags in .NET. So there is, um, and, and I'll just show that, there are NuGet packages direct for feature management um, in ASP.NET. So you can leverage just using a config file. So I have a config file, I have a feature management, I, I have, you know, true, false, like I can, in a config file. So this could be, um, taken from an environmental variable. So I could transform this config file on deployment. I could, you know, if I was running this in a container, I could pass these type of values as environmental variables or command line arguments. This feature management library interacts with the .NET config system. So by just defining that you have feature management and you're defining some feature flags, and this can be a nested object, .NET can interact with feature flags and it gives you tools to render out um, controllers, render out parts of Razor syntax, all without having to really leverage a lot of the management side of the feature flags. Now, I, I, I do want to get into those, but I just wanted to show how there is capability in .NET to have these feature flags. So um, in my program CS, now this is a, a .NET 6 sample, you know, I've added in add feature management. When this initializes, it's going to take whatever configuration got built. So by default, to create builder will, you know, check for the app settings JSON. If there's a develop, it'll do that. Environmental variables, user secrets. Um, I could go and add app config, which I have in another sample. That will all get built into the configuration and then feature management will pick up um, the pieces that it needs to, to enable or disable features. And you can, you can track some of those in something like an enum, like, hey, I have a feature um, and, and it, it can just leverage the name of it to try to um, tie that back to, to this so I can keep my feature flags in a central place. Um, and this is all covered in a lot of the quick starts and tutorials out on docs, which I, I'll show you in a moment. But, you know, let's say I've got these, these razor, razor pages. You know, I can, I can inject a feature manager. I can say, is this feature enabled? And I can do something with that, that Boolean value. I, I could change a message. Um, I can, there's a feature called feature gate. So if this is turned off, you can't hit this endpoint. If it's turned on, you can. So let me just run this momentarily. And move my browser over. So this is just saying welcome. And if I go to slash flag. I can get to the feature flag page and I can see what that looks like by I get to the feature flag page and I don't have feature a on. Maybe I want to flip these around because I'm not using um, app config. I'm not using launch darkly. I, I would save, I would rebuild this. I'd have to restart my application um, in order to get this functionality registered. So now, I've turned on feature A, which says, welcome to a feature flag. And if I try to go to that flag page, well, it just says not found. 
Now there is configuration that's available uh, in uh, the feature management library where if it's a like a, a not found page or a disabled page, you can, you can do a redirect and you can tell it, I want you to direct to this not available page. But I just wanted to show just quickly that there are feature management libraries baked into .NET. Um, if I go out here to uh, the docs, let me. This is part of the Azure App Config documentation, but um, if I go down, you you can see um, once you connect it, a lot of this is here. We go. We're going to use the feature management library. We're going to add feature management. And now we can start doing things with our, our feature gates. We can leverage um, toggles around our markup. And so let, let me show you that now, um, that we can leverage app config. So this is Azure app config. Let me, boom. And you can see request counts, duration, how long calls take. They provide access keys so that you have a primary and secondary. You can rotate these. These can be managed through configuration. Um, you, you can you know, scale up how much storage you have or how many hits you're getting per hour. But down here is our configuration explorer. And there's th this is for um, configuration management. There is also feature management added to it. So if I wanted to do configuration management, I just wanted some key value. You know, my background color is black. If I wanted this um, created and maybe backed by Key Vault, App Config can do a lot of those things. Um, the feature management, where I have a feature and I can turn it on and off, these type of things also reflect as, and and that's what's showing here. These are showing as an app config feature flag. So they 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 are similar in in fact of it's a key value pair managed by Azure App Config, but it's through this feature management library. Um, and I'll I'll dive into some of the capabilities we have here in a moment. Let me go back to the app and stop this one. That was our feature management library. So when you're dealing with feature management, you get, oh, because I'm in the container and I last built it in Windows. Um, ow, I had swapped on there. Access key, yeah. Live debugging, everyone. Make sure that that's the right um, app setting. Connection strings app config. Is that case sensitive? Uh, no, it's not. The, the, um, this is, it's not case sensitive. So there we go. We're running now. I, I just always wondered that. And I realized I hadn't asked. I'd always just done it case sensitive. And it's, it's nice that it's not, honestly. Yeah. So in between, uh, I'll give you a little bit behind the scenes. Um, I, I store my slides in um, Markdown in my repo um, and then I store, uh, I have a dev container that has um, like Chromium so it can generate PowerPoints through a container. It's got um, the tools I use and the extensions for, for Visual, Visual Studio Code in there. And, and so I can develop this wherever. And then it's hosted in GitHub and I have CI CD that, um, that builds out and releases this using um, managed identities. And all of that is up in the repo. 
And here are the, the bicep files to build and release my samples. So I delete them in between talks and then I redeploy them. I, I keep the resource group and I just delete the resources and then I redeploy them. Um, I just have to update my um, user secrets. But there is a bicep file that defines, hey, I want an app service plan to run my web app. There's, I want an app config, go create this. I want a feature flag named beta. Go like, and I have a bicep file for my feature flag. Um, I have another feature and I want to do progressive rollouts on it. And, and, and I want to use a rollout percentage. And so like, these are all defined in, in a bicep file. And so I deploy those in between. And so sometimes I have to fix my, my setting when, when I forget to. I need to reopen the, uh, yep. so here we are. So we're in this. Um, I see beta is on. I've got beta. And if I go out to app config and I look at my feature management, yep, beta is on and feature A is on. Um, you can turn this off and you just have to, if you want your application to dynamically pick up that change, you have to make the same changes you would make for app config, for um, to the host builder essentially to dynamically pick up that change. So it's got like a five second, um, I think it defaults to 30 seconds, but you have to, um, and, and while I'm doing this, I'll, I'll let it, the cache expire. But if I come down here to program, you can see this one's a little different. So instead of just doing the normal create, um, I'm getting my settings, I'm getting my uh, connection string for app config and I'm adding Azure app config to my configuration. So this is gonna add into the, the JSON files, the environment variables, and then I configure a refresh. So if you don't do this, the only way for it to pick up new config changes or new feature flag changes is to stop your app and restart your app. You don't have to push new bits, but you have to start it and restop it. Um, so this, this lets you have some some capability and and so now it's it's picked up the cache the cache expired i can't get to beta anymore like the site's there but it even removed the menu item so so how did it, that menu item get removed this is that other feature that we have from our um feature flag so i've got this shared space here if i go in my layout here, here's my normal layout and i'm sorry everything's so big i'm, I'm trying to make it clear but you can see I've got, I've got, you know, syntax here. I've got this feature tag, and this comes from the feature tag helper. And I can say, hey, for feature beta, I want to render out um, this markup. So it's going to take me to the beta thing. Now you also see I have feature A here, and if you guys, you know, were eagle-eyed, you might have noticed that feature a was turned on but it wasn't showing up well that's because i have a targeting filter applied and if i come over here and i look at advanced edit i have a targeting filter and my default rollout percentage is zero so it's it's enabled overall but if you're not in this user list or in a group i define you don't get it. Um, and so this is where you can have people opt in to a feature. You could have like contoso.com or some sort of, of organization be like a ring one or a ring two. Maybe this is all your internal users and a couple of power users that signed up for it. Everybody else doesn't get anything. You know, if I change this to like a hundred percent, what will happen and it might, it might, might take it a sec because of the caching is I would expect to see feature a show up there and you know, the targeting, you can see I'm interacting with the feature the exact same way I'm interacting with the other feature and how you define that. Like I said, while I'm waiting on the caching, um, startup. Okay. So in startup, we're not only doing Azure app configuration, 
we're not only doing feature management, we're also adding in a targeting filter. And so this is just saying, hey, when you're when you're running your feature calculations, also take into account the targeting. Yep, so there's feature A. Just took it a couple of seconds. And I probably screwed up something in the code on that one. Uh, I'll just check the controller. Yeah, I accidentally said beta instead of feature A. So there you go, fix the code sample. But this is that feature gate we talked about. You know, I, I'm I'm doing things based on um, the feature flag. It's picking up that 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 toggle and it's allowing access to an endpoint or not, a, an action or not. And then these are letting you render out markup or not. Now the other way I could do this is I could inject at the top of the page. You know, in like a CSHTML, I could inject the feature manager. I could say if feature manager is enabled beta, this is just a helper to help with that. And, and this is documented out there. So if I go back here and look at feature tag. Tag helper class, constructor, namespace. Yeah, th these are all out here. And um, a lot of good uh, information here. Um, there is other ways to do it. So these are all doing that polling model that I talked about. And I'm, I'm bringing up the docs because it's good to know about these things. So this uses the Sentinel key. So maybe instead of checking every single property out there, you can set one property and it will refresh everything. So you could maybe use that as like a version thing that says go refresh everything when that gets changed. But there's another way you can interact with, with app config and feature flags, which is kind of push where you can hook it up to um, service bus and have service bus tell your application that a feature flag changed. So th there's a couple of options you can do to in in interact with um, Azure App Config. Um, and, and I mentioned those targeting filters, you know, so you can make your own targeting filters. So, and you can, so this is where when you're targeting things, maybe you want to give it some context. You want to give it user accounts. So you want to know which user or which group the user is part of so that that can be evaluated as part of your filter. Um, there's some samples where it will target a browser, so you can you can use a browser to to target things. And um, let me go back to the feature flags to yeah here. So I did the advanced editor. Here here's the easier editor. So you can see I, I want a, a time window, a certain time. I want some code I wrote myself. I want to write my own filter. You know maybe it's based on one of those, or maybe I type in my own. Uh, if I am using the targeting filter. What's the percentage for everybody? What's the percentage for you know people at the group or the user? Like this information is what's being fed by that 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 context. Um, that is pretty easy to interact with. You, you saw that there was some delays when I was trying to change my settings and get it to take effect right away. Um, again, Azure App Config can hold all your app application configuration where you just need to give it a connection string and then it can pull all your other app setting information. Um, and it can use references out to Key Vault as well as feature management. And we can go here and we can turn things on. You know, I can check it, I can uncheck it, I can interact with this pretty easily, and I have the capability to inter uh, to create and interact with these things through infrastructure as code. Um, you know, I, I do some progressive rollout sometimes in, in GitHub where I actually have three, so I deploy it out and I say, I want a 0% rollout. Could and I want to deploy it again. A little bit, Chris? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I have in my my workflow, like, hey, I'm going to log in out there, and then I want to deploy it with 0% rollout. 
and I want this flag turned on. And then I want this one turned on, but I want 50% rollout. Like I, I can interact with these things in bicep, but you, there's still those delays. There's that time. Um, and I mean, this is a great service and it integrates well with the feature management library, uh, like hand in hand. But there's another service out there that can do feature toggles and that's launched darkly. So I've got a sample for that one. And I, I want to show some of the similar things. Um, so. And this one I checked a little bit earlier. Um, I should have double checked my, my app config one. So very similar, no beta thing here. Um, if we come down and we look in our program file, we're not doing any of the app config stuff. We're not doing any of the, hey, go refresh your configuration settings. If we look in startup, you can see I've added a LaunchDarkly SDK. Now, now this is a NuGet package. You, 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 can, um, you can go look at the quick start from LaunchDarkly and how to do this, but I tweaked it a little bit in the fact that I didn't want to, in the middle of my application to say new launch darkly. So I'm actually making a singleton uh, for my launch darkly and I'm injecting a launch darkly client into my controllers where I need them. And I'm pulling just from my config, the SDK key that's blank here, but I've got it in my, my user secrets so that I can continue to operate. So. Hey, we, we've got our feature flag here. Um, I'm just going to copy that. And this is the launch darkly interface. So I'm, I'm going to do a thing real quick just to, to demonstrate that their stuff. So if I come here and I'm, I'm hitting refresh, nothing. I can turn this on. Why am I turning this on? Well, I'm going to do a demo. Yep, this is production. Let's, let's, let's push it. Boom. Five. It launched Darkly prides themselves on speed of of resolution and interaction. Like it is phenomenally fast. Um, you create projects in Launch Darkly, um, multiple feature flags. When you're creating it, you know, you can have a nice name in the key. There's different SDKs. So maybe you can interact with mobile or client side. Um, how do you want to interact with the variations? Do you need strings or numbers, trues or false. So they give you some options right in the interface um, with variations. And for individual flags, you know, this is where the same targeting stuff that we talked about applies. You know, you might need prereqs, like are they in a country or, you know, are they, um, does it depend on a flag? You know, what are we doing with, with user targeting? For true, maybe it's by an email address. Maybe, you know, I need to do other things with it. Maybe I need rules, you know, and I can look at attributes, country, uh, IP, it's anonymous, and I, I, I can do things to turn it on and off. There's workflows around this. And, oh, yeah, I just saw your, your statement about user secrets, and, and you threw me off for a minute. I was like, what? Question about user secrets? Um, now, there are a lot, there's a basic, Pro and I think enterprise version of Launch Darkly. And so you get different things um, based on your, your, your subscription level. Um, but yeah, you can uh, do experimentation and variations. Now, one of the questions from before was, how do you know about all the feature flags? One thing I love about what Launch Darkly does is they have a capability to do code references. Now, I haven't set this up in a while, but um, essentially they have a tool called LD Find Code Refs. And you can integrate this into your pipelines, uh, GitHub, Bucket, like you, you can do this. And so it'll it associate your feature flags with it being referenced in your code. And so you can start seeing how often feature flags are being used, where they're being used, and understand how you might want to roll them back. It's really, really cool. Um, but like I said, and 
some other differences I, I, that are between the two services, just since we're talking about those. So if you looked when I was in Azure App Config about getting started, I mean, yes, we have ARM templates and Bicep. We have all of that. There, the language support is not as extensive. I mean, there is language support and providers for .NET, of course, Java, JavaScript, Node, Python. When you look at Launch Darkly, it's a little different. Um, so if I get out of the docs and I go back to my feature flags, and I say, um, or it wasn't that, it was beta settings. Like there are, um, there, that's what I'm looking for, integrations. Nope, that's not what I'm looking for. I don't know what I'm looking for. <laughs> Language support. They, they have a few, both mobile and server side. So, so they have a little bit more extensibility. Um, I, I think it, it kind of gets down to where you want to be, um, what you want to leverage. I mean, it is possible to leverage lots and lots and lots of services. And um, it can add up quickly if you're paying for a lot of individual services that do individual things. Um, on the other hand, when you leverage a service that might do a lot of things, it might not do all of them the best. So you, you, you have options to weigh. Now, both of these do have historical stuff. You can see on a given day, at a given time, what a flag was set to. So you, this has you know, the JSON, the details, and the version. Um, on app config, I can look at a specific date and time. I can also leverage labels if I want to do that and I can compare them. This also lets you, and see, I wanna compare flags. I can also import and export from both of those. And both of them allow like recovery point in time um, stuff. So that covers most of what I wanted to talk about today with feature flags. Um, Sean, are there any questions top of mind for you, or have you seen any questions pop up in the chat while we've been talking? It, as of now, I got to say it's it, it's a, a no on both counts. Um, oh, you actually, I do have one question regarding the uh, the, the grouping and, and being able to turn on feature yeah. flags for groups. Is that is that specifically for security groups or groups of people, or for example, can I configure that such that yeah. I have a certain type of object? In my database, and or you know, if 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 yeah. it released to that kind of entity, then we can turn the feature flag on, for example. So that that's covered here in the docs, and Great. um, they they actually have, um, let's see here. So this is using users as like test at Contoso, mm -hmm. um, where you can, and this is the discussion. So inside like a group like Contoso.com. Maybe it's 50 50. We're doing experimentation. Mm -hmm. Or you can enable it like this for one person. And it's this is always on for them. Now you could say for Contoso, it's 100%. For everyone else, it's zero. So you can do it by like a domain name. You can do it by uh, an AD group. And that's where that, and I think I have that code sample still up. Yeah. That's where uh, something like this filter um this this context might come into play ah okay where where, where it and this is um an i http context accessor so you and i'm i, I apologize if i skipped over that this is where we add it you can add a service like say i want to add a service for this context accessor and that can um the targeting context accessor is something in the feature flag um, feature filter uh, namespace. And this will take the con uh, HTTP context and it'll get information off of it. So this particular one was getting the user identity name, getting the groups off of them. This was getting the user ID. This had some code that was um, extracting that information for you to do all that fun uh, targeting here. And, and and that is all covered in this example. 
um, in this perfect. document. That's and that's, that was the piece I was missing, was that it wasn't specific for I, yeah. users. It was to that context accessor that you can program yeah. to do what you need, which is, that's great. I see we have a, another question here. Uh, what is the best way to retire old feature flags I no longer want now that they are spread throughout my source code? <laughs> <laughs> Any tips on that? You mentioned the technical debt. So how do we, uh, yeah. how do we prune that technical debt safely? Well, I mean, like I said, LaunchDarkly offers uh, a code references capability. I, I think that going back to some of those best practices, have them in a central place, have good consistent naming. Um, there's There was a blog post from GitHub actually uh, like a year ago where they had like how they leverage feature flags and they use Ruby for a lot of stuff. And they actually had like a Ruby bot that would go through and after the PR got merged, it would then remove like it, it, it used pattern matching to find the blocks of code from like the feature flag and like remove remove them and submit a new PR. So you could merge that later on once it was removed. You're looking for that now, aren't you, Sean? I am. I'm going to paste it in the chat right now. I think I <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I do have some resources there, like the feature management documentation and, and mine. But uh, I if you've deployed something out and you were protecting it with the feature flag, and you've released it and it's sitting there for a little while, um, you can either um, go ahead and create a PR for it to be removed, but you start running into drift pretty quickly. Or you can, um, I, I usually try to like do a deprecation and ha actually have stories added to remove those. And, and they need to be prioritized because people need to understand it is technical debt, that if you leave it there, it will grow and, and, and start walking around and you know, turn the Skynet and try to murder us all. So, yeah, I, mean, I agree. That <laughs> tends to be one of my practices has been, yeah, if you introduce a feature flag, also introduce a task somewhere in your work stream to clean yeah. up that feature flag, preferably with an understanding of the risk that's attached to that feature flag. Um, of course, we can't always understand the full extent of the risk that a feature flag poses, like, for example, Night Capital, right? Some of those situations, hopefully none of us are, are necessarily in that high of stakes environment. But I think, at least identify yeah. what some of the risk is ahead of time is good. We we had another question come in around uh, from from Eric on um, recommendations around automated testing of different combinations of flags. So right, if you've got speaking of that technical debt, right, you have different permutations or pathways through your code that can happen based on the flags. Um, question around yeah. you know, testing combinations. How, what's mm -hmm. your approach from an automated testing perspective on that? So um, automation makes life easier. So I'm going to assume you're talking about how do I do automated tests on these things, which I think is the right way to assume. Um, I'm going to take a small detour. But when you have um, things like LaunchDarkly where you could use a REST endpoint or an API to toggle a feature flag um, for an environment, when you have uh, REST endpoints and CLI and you know, bicep files where you could target a feature flag file, you know, here, maybe I'm doing dev QA, maybe I do it that way. Like, I, I, I'm not saying that this is the way to do it. I'm just saying maybe you were doing something like this where you could see these, you could compare what they looked like and you could automate it. You could script it. You could say, run my automation test. Now hit this endpoint in dev and run my automation test again and hit this endpoint in dev to change the toggle of the flag and hit like that would give you that capability. Um, but get, then again, whenever I'm talking about testing, I always say, don't do the ice cream cone. Don't do this. Where you don't have any unit tests and then everyone's just manually testing. Have automation as far up as you can go. Right, and so in terms of an automated testing strategy, certainly you could use something like property-based testing if you want to do combinatorial testing around different feature flags yes. to make sure that you're, um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with property-based testing, like FS check or something like that, if you've got a few feature flags in combination and you want to guarantee that your system's going to work that way in certain circumstances, you can pass those combinatorics there. Or even if you're using something like NUnit, um, I think XUnit to a certain extent has combinatorics yeah. built in. Um, so you can leverage some of the native 
native uh, functionality of those of, of those uh, libraries as well to, to accomplish that. But I think Chris yeah. is Chris is right. The key is definitely do automate and and test your feature flags. And if you have a gazillion feature flags, that may be a smell that you either haven't cleaned it up or that perhaps there may be some additional refactoring you can do to pull that out so that the segments of those systems controlled by those feature flags are a little easier to, to understand, I think. Yeah. No, but that was a great, great question. Absolutely. I will say I don't I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, so we'll give it a few more minutes. But um, I will say, Chris, thank you, thank you for you know. Oh, you know, I'll have one more question. Any fun okay. stories or any any big successes that you can speak about in general terms of of a time when you've leveraged feature flags yourself? Like you said, you've been all over the industry. Like, is there something that stands out for you in terms of a time that you've implemented or or seen feature flags implemented that was incredibly successful? Um, yeah, and like I said, in the in the retail space, um, in the restaurant industry, we've leveraged feature flags and um, to you know, enable services to consistently get deployed as we prepare to release those features. Um, I think keeping that distinction in mind that we can push bits and we can have conversations around feature release and, and they don't always have to be tied. You do have to, I, and I think it is a sign of maturity, like having testing, having automation, having, um, confidence in your pipelines, confidence that you can redeploy things um, if you need to, that you can minimize disruption, that you can create environments on the fly and do load testing. Like those are all things talked about in the state of DevOps report and developer velocity reports and accelerate in the Phoenix project. They all drive success and reduce so many headaches. Absolutely. You know, I think that's a, a great thing. I, I've heard them referred to, too, as the, you know, a, a sort of safety harness where, you know, with, with similar to automated testing, what they really, the what they able, enable you to do is move quickly with confidence in a certain direction. And there's there's a power to that um, when, when we're building and delivering software that has value and impact. The faster that we can move without losing confidence, it, it, there's, there's typically the ability to harness that power of change or that power of making an impact, you know, sooner, sooner safer, happier, I think is very right, one of the, the, the common yeah. terms we're, we're going with today based on the book but i think that they're that having that safety harness in place is, is really key um we do so I went, oh sorry yeah let's, let's finish up and then we'll or follow up and then we'll have a, another question well i went back to this slide because of white case question so if you want to go ahead and highlight that i'm sorry perfect yeah so recommendations around feature flags and microservices environments so i, I mentioned it here but feature flags can coexist with advanced deployment models. And when we're dealing with microservices, when we're dealing with containers, when we're dealing with those type of things, you can have um, deployment models that exist in um, pushing the bits out. And then you can also have feature flag models that can enable or disable features inside the microservices. Um, I think that what you see with microservices a lot, especially when they're container-based, you start seeing the blue, green, and canary deployments that are based only on the container images. So, you know, version one is out everywhere. We're going to roll out version two, and it's going to stand them up, and it's going to route traffic to the new nodes slowly, or it's going to bring up more new nodes and take down old nodes and, and, and you know, go one way or the other. And that's just different bits that are going to be getting traffic or not getting traffic. And yes, you can implement some feature flags that way. I mean, you can determine, do I want some traffic there or I want some traffic over here? But then I ask, well, how's your application architected? Because it, it can affect how you're doing that at a higher level API, you know, at a higher level um, API gateway style. Do you have whole different server farms? Are you running three or four different copies of your entire application? And you're directing traffic to different copies of your, your application based on feature flag. How many versions back of your application are you going to keep? You know, do you just want to do blue green and have two and you, you're 
you know that you're deploying bits and everything's working fine and you're just you know you've successfully deployed and it's running right and now you're using a feature flag to um, direct people to different types of functionality or do, do you want to have one instance with it on this with it off this with this combination this with that combination and now you have to worry about potentially a lot more instances of, of things running because you're you're maintaining versions and, and functionality it I think it's a combination and, and they complement each other it's a peanut butter and jelly you know chocolate and peanut butter thing you know you got get your Reese's in my peanut butter I, I hope that answered that for you <laughs> Uh, Sean, do you have thoughts and, on that? And if not, at least you've got a craving for Reese's. <laughs> so regardless. Um, no, no, I, I think that's fair. I think that typically, you know, when you think about it, I think the blast radius is a good analogy on that. I think that when you have feature flags, you know, there are certain levels at which you want the change to take place based on the bits. But I think in terms of having those stealth changes take place under the, you know, behind the scenes and having you control them, I think having it like an API gateway type place where the microservices know to respect that does give you the ability to, to phase those in and out as you would need to. And I think that kind of flexibility tends to possibly trump the the, the ability to do it, you know, at the microservices themselves. But I agree with Chris that there's, the, the key there is that there's not going to be one answer. You're going to have to think about what do I want the blast radius of this change to be? How quickly do I need to enable Enable this? What kind of functionality do I need to enable? How, what is the risk around cleaning it up? How long are these services going to stay deployed for? And I think these kind of, it's a multifaceted consideration, but what, what you want to think about is, okay, given that we want to make that kind of change, well, how do we reduce the risk and how do we make sure that it can be uh, rolled out safely and cleaned up quickly? Um, so I think if you if you think about you keep the conversation at those kind of high levels, it's probably going to guide you towards the best solution in terms of which space is going to best benefit from from receiving that future flag. Yeah. No, couldn't agree more. Okay. All right. And I don't see Adam, I don't what see is anything. wrong with you? What is wrong with you? Carrots and ketchup? What I mean, I guess carrots and tomatoes, but eh, I don't know. Is that like custard and fish sticks? <laughs> I know what I'm not going to find out. So I'm going to say about that. Doctor no, Who reference, say, man. Doctor Who reference. Oh, thank you. Yes, yes. Thank and thank you. I, just, <laughs> I do want to say again, Chris. Thank you so much for being here. It was a, a great talk. Learn, learned a bunch, and I think one of the things I appreciated seeing the most is those practical applications using using both the Azure App Config, which I haven't gotten to play around with yet, and using Launch Darkly. So I do want to say. Uh, thank you so much for coming out, spending your night with us, and I really appreciate you making the time. And and uh, thank you as well to everybody in the audience for showing up tonight. Great questions. Um, thank you for, for engaging with us and coming out to learn some new stuff. We hope you and your families are well. We hope that you uh, are enjoying development wherever you are, and uh, we wish you a, a, a safe and happy evening, and we hope to see you again next month. So stay tuned on the Meetup channel, on YouTube, subscribe to us, smash that like button or subscribe button wherever it appears for .NET DC, and we hope to see you in the future. So, Chris, uh, thank you again, and, and with that, we will bid you good evening. Thank you, Sean, and thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. All right, thanks. Good night, everybody.